Hey, see, James, James is here. I, I, I think we, we before we dive into the game and we, we need to debut our brand new segment. It is the call of the night brought to you by nobody. It's brought to you by absolutely nobody for a variety of different reasons. The main reason was we just got the idea yesterday. If you would like to be the proud sponsor of our call of the night, email Rich, Rich Ripley at odyssey.com. That's Rich dot R I P L E Y at odyssey.com. And you can be the proud presenter of the call of the night. Rich Ripley, Rich dot Ripley at odyssey.com. Casey, what do we got now? Can I say this real quick? Reference it just a little bit. It will get better once we can get our guy, Mark Jones. No, oh, it will. No, but it will. Sure. Good broadcast. The, the call of the night. Keegan Murray. Jones, that's basically his go to. Huge offensive repertoire. Murray certainly has it. He's a drifting left, shoot right. And it is a six point Sacramento lead. That's Murray again. <laughs> they, they did stink right there. <laughs> they did stink. Yeah, that was. <laughs> <laughs> they did stink right there. Maybe we should have waited till Mark called the game before we debuted this segment. <laughs> that was just bad. That was probably bad planning on our part. Hey, it is. I was like, oh, damn. Man, where else did this game play? No, only on sports. That, that one's on the house. We'll do. We'll, we'll give you the bad call on the house. Uh, you don't have to pay. You don't have to pay for that one. That was <laughs> nice. But you guys get the gist of what's going on here. All of the night brought to you by nobody. And I see why after hearing that call. <laughs> <laughs> All is right with the world. Playoff droughts ending this year. Come on, man. That was a beautiful performance last night. Tuesday overreactions. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Okay. Take, we'll take the overreaction out of this. The, the, the overall performance from the team last night was very good. Oh, I thought they got off to a really bad start. I thought they couldn't hit a shot early on. Uh, and the offense looked really, really clunky. And, uh, like, look, if Mike Brown is going to – if he's going to stick with his KZ Akpala uh, idea, which I, I'm not saying is a bad idea because I think he is a tremendous defender. Um, but if he's going to stick with that lineup, uh, KZ's got to hit three-pointers and De'Aaron Fox has to hit three-pointers and Sabonis has to hit three-pointers – Everyone has to hit three pointers. You, you have to space the floor, um, and so I thought it looked a little clunky early. Um, but I also liked Mike Brown calling timeouts, lambasting his team, sending him back out there, and having like true like corrections being made. And uh, you know, we had a couple of moments. Uh, Malik Monk got burned on a couple of plays. De'Aaron Fox got burned. Um, like just let Russ run right by him early in the game. I thought that that was you know preseason basketball at its finest. Um, but the second half, what did they outscore them? Like 64 to 29. It was yeah. a, a lamb bashing in the second half, and the Kings really came out to play, even if it was the second, the third, the fourth unit. Well, James, I guess I'll bring up the question that I posed earlier, because I agree with you. If there is KZ Akpala in the starting lineup, you're going to need everybody to hit shots. But there's another move that could be made. And I don't I don't think it's going to happen personally. But the move may be you move Keegan into the starting lineup at the 4. You got Casey Akpala as your perimeter uh defender, your primary perimeter defender, and that means Harrison Barnes comes off the bench. Don't think it happens, but if you are going with Casey Akpala, that that's one way to get some shooting in there with everybody else around him. Yeah, I mean, Harrison Barnes is a great shooter as well, though. So oh, great of him. Yeah, I mean, he he's got, not a like, great shooter. He's a, he's a he's a thirty nine to forty percent for the last three years from three. Yeah, yeah, Harrison Barnes. Yeah, Harrison Barnes has been a mm -hmm. light a knockdown three point shooter for the last couple of years and. Um, he's a guy that, you know, for my money, he just doesn't shoot enough. That's, that's the problem. So, I mean, eventually, you know, you hope that, uh, that Keegan can step into it. Yeah. But like, I'm looking at his numbers, 39.4% last year, 39.1% the year before 
38.1 the year before that, before that, and uh, when he got traded to the Kings, 40.8 percent. I mean, that's that's about as good as it gets. Um, yeah, that's that's a really really good three point shooter. So I, I'm comfortable with Harrison Barnes being in that starting lineup. Um, and to be honest with you, I think the most interesting thing that we're seeing early on is that Keegan Murray, not only is he coming off the bench, but Keegan's playing the three off the yeah. bench. And we saw it in practice on Saturday, mm-hmm. and I pointed it out. But then at the game, that's exactly what we saw. I mean, he's playing alongside Trey Lyles and Rashawn Holmes. I'll also point this out. Keegan told us early in camp that he had spent the last couple of weeks playing in the high post. And I thought that that was interesting because I was like, okay, why are they playing him in the high post? Because he's devastating in the post. Um, So if you put him on the right or the left block, that's fine. Um, And he's also a great three-point shooter. Uh, He can take guys off the dribble. So he's kind of a three-level scorer. I mean, he's really more like a a two-and-a-half-level scorer. But um, if you're going to put him in the high post, that means he's going to be running the offense. And I think that might be what we're going to see with the second unit is that when Sabonis steps off the floor that Keegan Murray steps in and is that offensive cog that the Kings have been looking for off the bench. And I thought he made a couple of really nifty passes. He only ended up with, I think, one assist. But that's just because the Kings couldn't hit shots at all. I thought he made shots, uh, he made passes that I just, I didn't know he had in him that he had the court vision to make. And they weren't anything spectacular. They were just passes that you don't make unless you're really scanning the floor. And uh, so, yeah, I think there's some interesting things going on here. I feel like there's a lot to talk about with Keegan Murray. You were talking about the passes that they made. Um, Did you see the movement that you wanted to see, the the, the movement that Mike Brown has been preaching about, the movement that Keegan and Kevin Herter and the different guys uh, in the the media scrums have talked about over the last week? Did you see that, that movement there, particularly from the starting unit? I thought it was okay. I didn't think it was great, but I also don't think they played through Sabonis enough. You know, we've heard them talk about um, an over-reliance on the pick and roll in the past, that this team really does get caught just running one pick and roll after another, after another, after another, until they become extremely predictable. And I I can understand that. Uh, So they're going to try to go to a little bit more of a read and react system. I still want to see the pick and roll. I mean, the pick and roll, they go to the pick and roll so much because it works, especially with Sabonis and Fox. So I want to see more two-man game here and there. It doesn't have to be every possession, um, but I definitely would like to see an expanded offense because I think that's something that we've seen over the last couple of years, that there comes a point where they are just like, they're boring. And the second you pull Sabonis off the court last year, I think it it really shined a light on it, just how bad the offense looked before he got there. And especially when you take uh, Halliburton out of it and sort of his ability to play in the pick and roll and set guys up. Um, yeah, I think it's interesting. We're, we're going to have to s- let Mike Brown coach uh, this team for, you know, was certainly a couple of years. But but really, like, I don't remember another season where, um, let's see, the Kings, they had media day on Monday. They had practice on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. They had Friday off. They had practice on Saturday. And then they had a short practice before they hopped on a plane. So they had five days of practice with a completely new group before they played a preseason game. So this preseason game seemed like it was really pushed forward. And I think that's why we saw some of the clunkiness, some of, I mean, a read and react system takes a long time to develop. You know, it takes guys to get comfortable with each other. And you're you're doing a read and react system with realistically two players who have played together, and that's Harrison Barnes and, and uh, De'Aaron Fox. It's going to take time to develop all that. And so, yeah, I think this will look a lot different in three in two weeks when the season opens up. Yeah, I agree with you um, on that for sure. Do you think, uh, talking about the starting lineup, do you think that's the starting lineup we see opening night? Or was he just kind of experimenting with some stuff uh, last night? Yeah, I think he was experimenting. And he might experiment with that during the regular season as well. I mean, Casey mm-hmm. Akpala is an elite defender. Um, I, like, I, I've watched enough footage of him outside of, you know, him playing with, uh, you know, this group or, or that um, like the small sample size. Like if you really watch him play defense, he's a very, very good defender. The question is whether your your offense is good enough with him in there. If the, the other four guys are strong enough and have a strong enough bond and chemistry to make it work because he is going to force, uh, you know, uh, teams just aren't going to defend him on the perimeter until he proves he can he can hit the, the, three pol- the three-point shot. 
if that's the case, they're going to just clog the lanes and Fox and Sabonis are going to have a really difficult time. Um, but as far as like a defensive cog, you know, I look at Matisse Thibel and with the 76ers and we all know that like that guy, I mean, he averaged three points a game when one year starting, that's just not going to fly for the Kings. They don't have a Joel Embiid. Um, and, and they don't have a James Harden and a Tobias Harris, like the combination of players that are around him, make it work. Even, you know, they always have a three point shooting, uh, guard that's, that's in the backcourt, whether it's Maxi or, you know, Danny Green in the past, like that works because you have such good offensive players. The Kings are going to have to show that they can be that kind of offensive team. And when Fox starts a game one for six from, from the field, and isn't hitting his three point shots, and Sabonis isn't taking three point shots, and Akpala is going to be difficult to to pitch in that in that situation. Those mm-hmm. other guys have to carry the weight in order for Akpala to work. CSPN thirteen twenty Kings Insider and creator of the Kings Beat James Ham with D and KC here on KIFM West Sacramento ninety eight point five FM KRX QHD two Sacramento ESPN thirteen twenty driven by Lashes Elk Grove Dodge always live on the very free. Odyssey at. We're also on twitch.tv slash ESPN 1320, youtube.com slash ESPN 1320 uh, if you want to watch the show. Is Casey Akpala in the starting lineup perhaps uh, an indictment on the defensive efforts of the other four? No. I mean, I just think that, you know, you're going to try something. And um, it really does, like I talked about this on the podcast we just had, and, and I've got a piece going up in a little while. Like my first year covering this team, I'll tell, uh, like that first year, Marcus Landry was signed to the team, right? So we got to training camp and it was supposed to be like Dante Green and Omri Caspi battling it out against each other for the starting small forward spot. Well, Carl Landry's little brother, Marcus Landry, uh, was signed to like a, a summer contract and showed up to camp and Paul Westfall ended up starting him the first two games and... Marcus Landry was really good and probably deserved to to not only make the team, which he did not two weeks later, um, but he probably deserved to play. And they they had brought in, I think it was Antoine Wright, and they had some other guys that they were going to try at that position and like mix and match and do all this stuff. But at the end of the day, um, you know, it, that's an example of where just because you play someone in preseason doesn't even mean they're, they're going to make the team. Just because you're starting them in preseason – and that I don't think that will be the case with KZ. I think he will make the team. But I also know that like most NBA coaches, they don't want to put their best five players in the starting five. Because then where are you going to go from there? That's it. Like if something's gone wrong, you've already put your best players out there. You got to have something else in reserve on the bench. And that's why I think we are seeing Keegan Murray on the bench right now. Um, because I think he is one of their best five players, but for right now, it makes more sense. He's going to get more touches with that second unit. And the fact is that it, if they, they, uh, decide that Akpala isn't the answer, that doesn't necessarily mean that Keegan Murray is the answer. It could mean that Akpala falls completely out of the rotation and they go to someone different, uh, Trey Lyles, or they go to, uh, Chima Moneki. They just try something completely different at that position to give them a different look than what they're already putting out there. So um, I I think people shouldn't read too much into game one of preseason. Um, If it's game two, game three, and he's still the starter, then Casey Akbal is probably going to be the starter. Um, But even that, how long will it last if their offense isn't working? Mm. Um, You look at what they have shooting wise, and we didn't see it last night. You know, they, they didn't shoot the ball very well from beyond the arc last night. But do you think that's um, kind of an admiration, like guys just kind of getting getting a feel for everything? Or do you think they they have enough shooting? I know that was a big emphasis this offseason. And then you see the first game, they shoot, what was it, 12 or 29 from beyond the arc or something like that. Is that, in your opinion, an admiration? Or do they need to still be hunting for more shooting somewhere? Well, I don't think any team can have enough shooting. Like, Like, that's just the NBA way now. You know, when teams are shooting so many three pointers, it's crazy. Um, I'm gonna say that that for this team though, specifically right now, I think they do have enough. It's just combinations of players. You got to figure. You know, it, it just goes back to like the tough guy from last year. They they brought in some tough guys that you know were gonna help change things. Guys like Tristan Thompson, and you know 
when you bring in tough guys, even Alex Len, that's fine. You can have tough guys, but if they don't step on the floor, then they they can't be a tough guy, you know. So again, when you're talking about the three point shooters, like you know, it doesn't really matter when you bring in a Sam Merrill if Sam Merrill's not going to play, or Terrence Davis can be a great three point shooter, but if he's not playing, it doesn't really matter. So you got to have the guys that are on the court that are playing be really good three point shooters. Which, like, look, I think the the interesting thing about Casey Akpala is that he was a very good offensive player in his sophomore year at Stanford. He was a good three point shooter. He he was a good player offensively. I think he averaged nineteen points a game in his in his sophomore season before he went into the into the draft. He's got all the tools. You just he's been sitting like on the bench in Miami for three years. We we have no idea what he is and who he is as a player. And until he proves his three-point shooter, it doesn't even matter if he hits a couple, you know? He's got to prove that he can do it night in and night out in order for defenses to actually play him on the defensive end. And, uh, you know, something that, you know, last season we saw, Mo Harkless was never able to prove it. He couldn't prove that he can hit the three. And even though the Kings were a much better team when he was on the court, it just, everyone else, like, it didn't feel right. It didn't look right. And I know we got to a certain point in the season, and they were like 15 and 15 with uh, Mo Harkless at, in the starting lineup. And that team was horrible. And he was at 500 as a starter. And it shows you that a defensive player can change the whole complexity of what you're doing. But the other guys have to really pick it up in order for that to happen. Keegan was really comfortable. Uh, last night with that second unit and aggressive um, in getting his points. Is that something that can translate if he were to be moved to the starting lineup or if this is a earn your spot type thing? Is that something that could translate with Harrison and Sabonis and Fox and Herter or Monk on the floor at the same time? Yeah, I, I mean, I think if you look at, even if you plug him in right now, he's your fourth or your fifth option in the starting lineup. And that's not because he deserves I, that. He is, though. I feel like he, he might wind up being your third. Well, it might that might be the case. It might be the case. But it also, I mean, we have to respect the fact that Harrison Barnes has done it for more than, you know, sure. summer league and, a, and one preseason game. You know, he's done it for, for the last decade in the NBA. And so, like, you just, you're going to have trust in him. And then where do you put, if he's going to be, let's say he is your third and Harrison's your fourth. Well, what does that make? Kevin Herter is now your fifth option, and he's such a lethal weapon. And and again, the, the key to Kevin Herter is he's going to space the floor. So it's not just that, you know, even if he is in your starting lineup and you have to actually play him, you actually need the three-pointers from Kevin Herter. You need right. him to have 10 to 12 shots a game. It's one thing to have a shooter. It's a whole other. I mean, how many times do we have to complain that Harrison Barnes doesn't shoot the ball enough? If Harrison, if, if uh, Kevin Herter is your fifth option and he's just not getting enough touches— that's also going to be a problem. And so I, I think it's just, it's Mike Brown has a lot of figuring out to do. He's got a bunch of puzzle pieces and he's got to figure out where they all fit. And I think for right now, he's going to be grasping at straws at, in, in certain situations and other situations. It's going to feel really comfortable. If you looked at the second unit, the second unit looked really solid and balanced. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the second unit that made a lot of sense. Um, but you got to have your guys play better. You know, some those guys have to hit shots as well. Um, but yeah, I think that there's just going to be more tinkering, and that's what preseason and training camp is about. It's about tinkering and, and trying to figure everything out. And and I do think, you know, it won't be that long before Keegan Murray is in the starting lineup if it's not opening night. I mean, he's going to be pushing for Rookie of the Year right out of the gate, and the Kings are going to want to embrace that, and that means he's going to have to slide into that starting lineup at some point. Y'all remember Tinker Toys? Oh, of course. Lincoln Logs and Tinker Toys. Tinker uh, Toys. Yeah. There's little things that you like connect. They were like sticks and wheels. That's all it was. It was tinker yeah. Toys. So yeah. you tinker, I immediately think of Tinker Toys. My grandma had them. I don't yeah. remember that. I remember the thumb uh, wrestlers, though. Oh, I had those. I had the big rubber, the, the, the big giant rubber guys, too, where when you punched one of them, like the, the whole paint would like smear <laughs> off. I, I yeah. had them. Did you have Rock 'em Sock 'em? Where the the, the, the I, no, I never really had those I things. I played that. I didn't. I didn't have yeah, it. It wasn't mine. Okay. I All felt right. like that was big money. I didn't have the big money. I had the I had the little the little rubber guys. The Rock'em Sock'em <laughs> was the big money for me. <laughs> uh, that's funny. James, what'd you think about De'Aaron Fox last night? Not the best shooting performance, but one thing that I I 
take out of that personally is, you know, it wasn't the best shooting performance, but he found a way to get some numbers on the board. He only he didn't play much, but he was at 10 points, whatever the case may be. And one of the things that I noticed from a lot of um, a lot of top tier players is that happens from time to time. Like you're not shooting the ball well, but they find a way to get easy buckets. They usually find ways to get to the line, knock down their free throws. And that's how you get to your people that average 23 points a night. They're not always on and shooting great, but they find a way to get those numbers come hell or high water. What did you think about Fox's performance last night? Yeah, so, okay, well, first of all, uh, in the chatty house, we're, the Erector set was the biggest, that's the rich kid toy. If you if you had Lincoln Logs and Tinker, to- and Tinker Toys, it was the Erector set with the little tiny screws and nuts. That, that's the rich kid had those. Yeah. Um, okay, so when it comes to Fox, look, I'm going to say it straight up. I, I was disappointed. I was disappointed because I thought, it was just the same stuff that we saw last year during the bad times until we got to the late second quarter when he was in for the second time and he put his foot down. I don't care about his numbers. Win the game. Make winning plays. Don't let Russell Wils- uh, Russell Westbrook blow by you and go right to the basket when your coach is yelling and screaming about playing defense. Don't have your coach yelling at you to run the ball up and down the court. Um, when you're open, hit your wide open shots, which he didn't do. Um, and then, you know what? Like the creative stuff, the amazing stuff when he's getting downhill and running at the rim. Like, where is that in the first quarter? Where is that in your first stint? Set the tempo to open the game. Don't make people wait for it. Set the standard of how the game is going to go, the force you're going to play with in the opening minutes don't try to get your feet wet and like oh dabble a little bit in what's happening hit it hard in the beginning and then you set the standard of what's going to be expected for the rest of the game not from just from you but from your teammates and i want to see that early i don't want to wait until right before halftime when the game is clunky and ugly anyways already what do you think changes sunday i just think they'll be better like they're gonna have four days of practice and that's Four days of practice today versus four days of practice in the middle of the season means something totally different. They're still trying to get comfortable. They're still trying to figure things out. They do know right now is there's one big dog who's leading everything, and that's Mike Brown, and he's telling them exactly what's going to happen. Now it's their job to interpret what he's doing and put it on the floor and make it work. And um, we saw him use timeouts really well and, you know, give guy guys an earful. We saw the whole situation on Saturday where uh, in all my time covering this team, I've never seen a coach in front of the entire team, in front of the media, call out a player, have him standing there and literally lay into him about not making a big enough impact on the court during a practice session. I, I just, I haven't seen it like in front of the media, that stuff happens all the time, but in front of the media, that doesn't usually happen. And I thought it was an interesting moment for Mike Brown and just the way he's going to handle things. I think Davion's the right guy to do that with because mm-hmm. he's just going to take it as a challenge and you're not going to hurt feelings. But I still thought it was like a, a, a moment that, again, we just haven't seen before. And you can't say, oh, it's just Luke Walton. I, like, this is my ninth head coach. I've never seen that before where a coach calls out a player in front of the media like that. Um, and I thought that's what this season's going to be about. It's about accountability from like day one if you're gonna get in a scrimmage at practice get busted up 12 to 1 uh your team's gonna lose 12 to 1 and you don't make an impact you should hear it that's it great stuff james thanks for jumping on with us uh for a little bit james will be back regularly scheduled program uh tomorrow at three jason jones joins us and we've got king's tickets king's opening night we have got you covered when we return here on dealer with kc on sacramento sports leader espn 1320 And that flew.